Israeli counterparts in Jerusalem, as I did on my trip to Israel earlier this year. Jerusalem is not just the heart of three great religions, but it is now also the heart of one of the most successful democracies in the world. Over the past seven decades, the Israeli people have built a country where Jews, Muslims, and Christians, and people of all faiths are free to live and worship according to their conscience and according to their beliefs. Jerusalem is today and must remain a place where Jews pray at the Western Wall, where Christians walk the Stations of the Cross, and where Muslims worship at Al-Aqsa Mosque. However, through all of these years, presidents representing the United States have declined to officially recognize Jerusalem as Israel's capital. In fact, we have declined to acknowledge any Israeli capital at all. But today we finally acknowledge the obvious, that Jerusalem is Israel's capital. This is nothing more or less than a recognition of reality. It is also the right thing to do. It's something that has to be done. That is why, consistent with the Jerusalem Embassy Act, I am also directing the State Department to begin preparation to move the American Embassy from Tel Aviv to Jerusalem. This will immediately begin the process of hiring architects, engineers, and planners so that a new embassy, when completed, will be a magnificent tribute to peace. In making these announcements, I also want to make one point very clear. This decision is not intended in any way to reflect a departure from our strong commitment to facilitate a lasting peace agreement. We want an agreement that is a great deal for the Israelis and a great deal for the Palestinians. We are not taking a position of any final status issues, including the specific boundaries of the Israeli sovereignty in Jerusalem or the resolution of contested borders. Those questions are up to the parties involved. The United States remains deeply committed to helping facilitate a peace agreement that is acceptable to both sides. I intend to do everything in my power to help forge such an agreement. Without question, Jerusalem is one of the most sensitive issues in those talks. The United States would support a two-state solution if agreed to by both sides. In the meantime, I call on all parties to maintain the status quo at Jerusalem's holy sites, including the Temple Mount, also known as Haram al-Sharif. Above all, our greatest hope is for peace the universal yearning in every human soul. With today's action, I reaffirm my administration's long-standing commitment to a future of peace and security for the region. 1 Thessalonians 5 But of the times and the seasons, brethren, ye have no need that I write unto you, for yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so cometh as a thief in the night. For when they shall say, Peace and safety, then sudden destruction cometh upon them, as travail upon a woman with child, and they shall not escape. But ye, brethren, are not in darkness, that that day should overtake you as a thief. Ye are all the children of light, and the children of the day. We are not of the night, nor of darkness. Therefore let us not sleep, as do others, but let us watch and be sober. But they that sleep, sleep in the night, and they that be drunken, are drunken in the night.
Greetings, my friends, and welcome back to Scripture and Prophecy. I'm Sean. Today is Friday, December 8th, 2017. And, um, well, it's been an interesting last few days, hasn't it? Um, you know, I want to, I know there's a lot going on with the, you know, uh, with President Trump and, and announcing that, you know, we're, he's going to be working on peace, peace and security, one of the words that he used, um, moving the embassy, uh, which by the way, he signed the waiver to not move the embassy, um, because apparently it's going to take a long time to do, so we'll just have to wait and see. And so lots of things going around and lots of excitement and some hyperbole and end time prophecy teachers are, you know, really jumping on top of this. And so I thought, you know, we need to take a step back and, uh, you know, lots of people within the community, prophecy community, are going nuts over this. You know, while I myself am assuming a posture of let's just watch, let's just see what happens. Let's not get too fired up, and uh, let's remember who we are. And let's remember what we are truly watching for. We are waiting and watching for Messiah. Now, with all that in mind. Um, I thought, you know, today let's lay our favorite pet doctrines aside, our favorite versions of end-time theology to the side for a minute. Let's open our hearts and our minds and let's examine these things. And so before I dig into some scripture and give two things that I think it's important for people to remember, let's go ahead and check out a couple of headlines concerning this historic move by President Trump. You know, regardless where you fall on as far as your opinion about this situation, whether you think it's good, whether you think it's bad, whether you don't care, whether you don't know, it's still historic nonetheless. Um, it's going to lead to some very serious, serious tensions, I think. And uh, so we must be paying close attention and we must be in prayer. And uh, so here's just a few headlines. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this. I'm sure you guys have seen plenty. Um, but uh, this headline here from Jerusalem Post, Palestine, Palestinian envoy says U.S. recognition of Jerusalem is declaring war. Uh, now the end begins. Dot com. Days of rage, Arabs, the UN, and all of Europe. Hamas calls for new Palestinian uprising against Israel. And, uh, of course, the UN Security Council is going to meet today about this situation I think today could be an interesting day um, to see if there's any, I don't know if you call it blowback or whatever you want to call it. Uh, it says Hamas plans day of rage in response to Trump's decision, Jer Jerusalem decision, that's Fox News. Additional nations said to consider moving em embassies to Jerusalem as well. That's timesofisrael.com. Um, Netanyahu, here's another one. Netanyahu, I already holding talks. I'm already holding talks with other countries who will make a similar recognition. So there's there's a movement of, of recognition, and there's also a movement of, you know, people losing their minds over this. And so the tensions are going to be high. Um, I don't think that this is just... You know, I know people are talking about how Trump's just keeping his word and he, you know, he's, and yada, yada, yada. I always can't help it but think that there's just more to the story. There's just a bigger thing going on behind the scenes uh, that we don't know yet. You know, something that was interesting. Uh, when this happened, the video came out, I was watching it. And, you know, he said the things that he said, and then he said, then he said peace and security. And I, I automatically started thinking, oh, man, I need to go and find that verse in the Bible and, and, and rip the audio clip to put, to put into the podcast, which I never got around to doing. And as I'm doing that and thinking about that, the, 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 the verse I'm talking about is the one that says, when they say peace and safety, sudden destruction comes upon them. And my phone rings, and it's a 
call from Babylon, New York. And if you're a Facebook follower, then you saw where I posted that. I was like, what in the world? Like, I, I get some random phone calls all the time. Not all the time, but, you know, once every few days. It's usually people trying to sell me gold and silver. Typically, it's from the West Coast, or they've gotten tricky with a route the number through a local number to my local city. I've never gotten a phone call from Babylon. And I just thought, man, and I'm not going to make a big thing out of it. But Trump's talking about, you know, declaring that Jerusalem is the capital of Israel, talking about peace and security. I get a phone call from Babylon. It just made me go, hmm, what's going on here? Is there something bigger going on here? And before I even get to some of the things, the two things I think we need to understand, uh, my still thought and it's, I'm hoping that it's not true because I don't want this to be true. But my thought is that war is coming. War is inevitably coming. And, um, you know, I think that's why we're being propagated with the North Korean boogeyman. Um, I think that this will ultimately lead to war with someone. I just, that's just my thought. So for whatever that's worth, I thought I would share that information with you. There's a couple of things that we need to understand. One is, you know, understanding prophecy. And and number two is understanding who Israel is. And uh, the prophecy one, nobody's going to have a problem with. But when I get into the Israel one, people are probably going to have a problem with that, um, even though I'm just going to quote scripture. Uh, but let's get started with, with understanding the first point I want to make. So... Let's start with this because this is very important to understand. Scripture and prophecy have multiple fulfillments, multiple layers, multiple relevancies. And and that's something that we need to understand with prophecy because people are always trying to put these timelines together. Uh, they don't understand history. They don't understand things that have already happened and, and uh, things that have not already happened or things that have happened in us in a kind of fulfilling prophecy, but there's a literal fulfilling that could happen. I mean, people do not understand that prophecy is like an onion. It's got many layers, many possibility possibilities. Um, prophecy rarely plays out the way people think that it will or think that it should. Just look at the Gospels. The, the disciples are always confused about what Jesus is doing and asking him why isn't he doing what they're expecting him to be doing. Because the prophecy, you know, here's the thing, we need to be careful. We need to be careful about being wise in our own eyes and in our own understanding. Prophecy is, prophecy is not meant for you to know the future. It's not. Only God knows the future. Only God knows the beginning from the end. I believe the purpose of prophecy is to build faith. You know, when you see these things come to pass, that's in the scripture... It confirms that our God is the one true God and the only God who dares to predict the future. But trying to act like you've got it all figured out, trying to own it, trying to nail it down, it's foolish. It's foolish. So back to my per first point. Prophecy has multiple fulfillments, multiple possibilities, multiple fulfillments. Um... So let's just, let me just choose one easy example. Uh, there's many to choose from. Let me just give you one example of how Scripture can be fulfilled in multiple ways. If you go to Hosea chapter 11, verse 1, it says, When Israel was a child, then I loved him, and I called my son out of Egypt. This is God talking. He's talking through Hosea. Anybody reading that at that time, would it, it would have been obvious what it's referring to, right? It's referring to when he called Israel, the nation Israel, his people, out of, out of Egypt, right? And that's obvious. I don't think anyone would have a problem with that interpretation. But, fast forward a thousand years, or, you know, we get into the Gospels, and uh, we're looking at Matthew chapter 2, verses 14 through 15, and it says... When he rose, he took the young child and his mother by night and departed into Egypt and remained there until the death of Herod to fulfill what the Lord had spoken through the prophet. Out of Egypt I have called my son. So here Matthew is saying that 
That situation was a fulfillment of Hosea chapter 11, verse 1. Two different meanings, two different purposes, two different times, two different ages. The point I'm trying to make is the Word of God is alive and breathing, and it's relevant to all generations. And we have to understand that when we're looking at prophecy and we're listening to people who claim to know a lot about prophecy and they're teaching prophecy and we're seeing events happen in the world and we need to understand this. There are many examples of this that I could point out, but I wanted to just make this point be, you know, before, uh, if, you know, before people get too excited and it's, and it's to help understand prophecy. You know, the abomination of desolation is another example. We have at least two examples of this being fulfilled in history that I can think of, and possibly we'll see a third. So, you know, you know, more on that some other time. The point I want to make is this is why we spend so much time talking about reading from and studying the Old Testament, the Tanakh, even biblical Hebrew stuff. It's not because we want to be Jewish or observe Torah as a means of salvation, or righteousness, or favor, we have that through Messiah. We do all this because what was will be again. Uh, Ecclesiastes uh, 1 verse 9 says, The thing that hath been, it is that which shall be. And that which is done is that which shall be done. And there is no new thing under the sun. So if we want to know our future, we want to be able to understand the times that we're living in, We want to better understand future prophecy than we need to understand the past, and we need to understand past fulfillments. Um, There's a lot of people get all confused when they're dealing with the book of Daniel, even some of the things that Jesus says uh, about end times, and uh, the book of Revelation, and and then they look at the Old Testament prophecies, and people have this tendency to make everything about them and about their generation not necessarily true at all. The second most and most important point I wanted to make this morning, and uh, sadly what I'm about to say will cause people to flip their lids and unsubscribe, and it's sad because it's it's just, it's a pillar of Christian faith and faith in Christian doctrine. It's undeniably clear by the scriptures. It's something we need to understand because it impacts everything we understand about end times theology and end time prophecy and much more. Um... Really, where you fall on this understanding will really change your view of end-time prophecy. And so we need to understand the answer to this question. And the question is, who is Israel? Who is Israel? Is it about the land, or is it about people? Because if it's about people, then who are the people? Now, the scriptures are very clear, and they make this very clear. It's very clear all throughout the New Covenant scriptures especially, but even in the Old Testament, that all who are in Messiah are the seed of Abraham, are the children of God. It does not, listen, it does not matter if you are a Gentile or a Jew. There is no advantage to being either one. Even Paul says, you know, what's the advantage to being circumcised or non-circumcised? There's absolutely none. It absolutely none. Either you know Christ or you don't, folks. People seem to think these days that God has two children and two plans of salvation, and that's not biblical at all. Jesus said, no one comes to the Father but by me. I tend to think that that means no one. No one is entering in but through faith in the finished work of Christ. No one, no one, no one, it doesn't matter what your bloodline is, no one is coming but through Jesus. Jesus also said, if they do not know me, they, or he said, they don't know me because they don't know my Father. Plain and simple, friends, if you don't know Jesus, then you don't know Jehovah either. And that's not my words or my opinion. That's what Jesus said. So people are all fired up about Jerusalem right now and as as if they need the city in order to worship God. And look, again, let's let the scriptures speak, 
Better yet, let's let Jesus speak, not our own personal uh, pet doctrines, not our own personal opinions. What does the Scripture say? One example, uh, Jesus is talking to a Samaritan woman in John chapter 4, uh, verses 19 through 21. And the woman said to him, Sir, I perceive that you are a prophet. Our fathers worship on this mountain, but you all say that in Jerusalem is the place where men ought to worship. And Jesus said to her, Women, believe me, the hour is coming when neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem will you worship the Father. Let me repeat that. Believe me. The hour is coming when neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem will you worship the Father. You worship what you do not know. We know what we worship, for salvation is of the Jews. Yet, the hour is coming, and now is here, when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. For the Father seeks such to worship Him. God is a spirit, and those who worship Him must worship Him in spirit and truth. And, you know, that is, that is one of the things that changed, right? Christ came, he died, he bled, he was, the, he was the atonement for all of humanity. Anyone who believes on him would be saved. The Holy Spirit has been sent down to us as a seal up upon us. You can fall on your knees in your house you have a mediator between you and God, Jesus Christ. You do not have to go to a temple. You do not have to go to Jerusalem. You don't have to, you don't have to do any of those things anymore, right? The seed of Abraham is anyone who's in Messiah. That is who Israel is. People try to make it two different entities with two different game plans not true. That is not what the scriptures teach. It's one faith. I'll give you one more scripture. And then, uh, then I'm just going to let this go. Because it's, it's like this. He who has an ear, let him hear. Because those who can't and won't let go of their favorite pet doctrines, no matter how many scriptures you read, they're just not going to. So it does, it's a waste of my breath. I'll give you Galatians 3. Uh, verse 26, you are all sons of God by faith in Christ Jesus. For as many of you as been baptized into Christ have put on Christ. Listen closely. There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither slave nor free. There is neither male or female. For you are all one in Christ Jesus. It's that simple, folks. If you are Christ, then you are Abraham's seed, verse 29 says. If you are Christ, then you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. That is who Israel is. It's those who are in Messiah. And you should be overwhelmed with joy in that fact. Some won't be because, again, they love the Hebrew Roots Doctrine and they love to interpret Scripture through their favorite doctrines instead of letting the, their doctrine be interpreted by the Scriptures. It's, I don't know, I don't know how else to beat this into people's heads. You're either in Messiah or you're not. It's that simple. No one's coming to the Father but by Jesus Christ. There's not a plan B. There's not another route. It doesn't matter who your father, parents were. It doesn't matter what your bloodline is. It doesn't matter if you live in, in Israel and speak Hebrew or you live in the United States and speak English. If you're in Messiah, you're a child, child of God. If you're not a Messiah, you're not a child of God. If you know Jesus, then you know the Father. If you don't know Jesus, you don't know the Father. Plain and simple. Plain and and simple. And so I'm going to leave that uh, where it is, and you can do what you want with that. Uh, another thing, you know, I I don't agree. I've been listening to Rick Wiles a lot on on this situation, and I don't agree with all his stances on Israel for sure. But he said something Wednesday night that I do agree with. He said a lot of Christians are trading the cross of Calvary 
for the Star of David. And, you know, I have felt that way. I mean, after, I, after you know, when he said that, I was like, yeah, I, I, I would have to agree with that. A lot of people are. They're trading in the cross for the Star of David. Uh, you know, and that's why I spent two weeks talking on the subject of returning to Messiah, remembering your first love. You know, everyone also, by the way, should do a study on the Star of David. Um, and, and, you know, as a side note, I also don't think we should be getting all of our information on what's going on in the Middle East and Israel from news guys here in the U.S., right? Because who are they getting their information from? They're getting it from the controlled media. This is one reason that I like to listen to people like Amir Safadi as an example from Behold Israel. He's an Israelite Christian, a Jew, and I feel like I can trust his reporting to be more accurate because he's closer to ground zero, right? He lives in Israel. He interacts with these people. Um, it's, it's a completely different view than, say, someone like Rick Wiles, who, by the way, I have you know the utmost respect for, but he's not in Israel. He doesn't see what's going on over there. He sees news articles that come through controlled media and then puts on a news show. And, you know, and we do the same thing. Um, but I just wanted to make that point that, you know, be careful about when it comes to dealing with the Middle East and Israel, you might want to listen to some people who are actually there and know what they're talking about. In addition to all that, I also don't think it's an accident that Israel exists in these last days. I do think it's prophetic. I do think we should pray for Israel, and we should certainly pay attention to to what's going on in Israel and in Jerusalem. I'm not. I'm definitely not discounting these things. I do think God has a hand in that, but we should be careful of assuming that we have it all figured out. Is my point, and, and we should also be caring about the and praying for the Christians in Israel who don't have it as easy as you might think. And especially the Christians, Christians in surrounding areas and surrounding nations, communities who are suffering from threats all around them. How about we spend two seconds actually caring about that? Because to, to me, that's a lot more important than whether or not the U.S. Embassy gets moved from Tel Aviv to Jerusalem. How about the church get obsessed about that for five minutes? about the Christian persecution and the Christians who are in desperate need all around, all around the world, and especially there in the Middle East and in those areas that we're talking about. And to those of you who have traded in Christianity for Judaism, who have traded the cross of Calvary for the Star of David, which some attest, and there's information out there, that the Star of David came from the Kabbalah, by the way. You can look into that for yourself. I don't have time to mess with that. But to those of you, again, who have traded Christianity and for Judaism, who have traded the cross of Calvary for the Star of David, I just humbly plead with you and in love, and I ask you, repent and remember where thou hast fallen. Return to your first love and do it quickly. Now, before people even start in uh, on me, you know, let's be clear about this. I'm not anti-Israel, obviously. I'm not anti-Semitic. Some of my favorite people to listen to and learn from are Jewish, many of them which aren't even Christian. Um, you know, I love Jewish culture. I love their passion for the scriptures and for the Torah. I love the biblical Hebrew language. But guess what? They need Jesus, just like you and I. And without Christ, there is no salvation to be had, no matter who you are, or where you were born, or where you live, or who your ancestors are. It's Christ or it's nothing. Either you know him or you don't. So my prayer for the Jewish people and the land of Israel today has nothing to do with embassy or even recognition for that matter. My prayer for them is that there would be a massive, unthinkably large awakening to the truth that Jesus, Yeshua in the Hebrew, is the Messiah. And I pray that they would cry out, Baruch, Haba, Bashem, Adonai, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. That's my prayer for them and my hope for them. Because outside of that, there is nothing and there is no hope. Outside of Messiah, outside of Jesus Christ. 
And again, I say, remember your first love, and I'm just going to keep hammering that message home, and I don't care if it costs me every single subscriber, every financial supporter. Jesus Christ is the King of kings, the Lord of lords. He is the only way to the Father. He is our only hope. He is our only salvation. Our works are worthless. Stench-filled, filthy rags before the Lord. The blood of bulls and goats are worthless. The temple is no longer a building, my friends. It's the human body. It's you. The Spirit of God is in inside every believer. The only thing that saves me is being washed in the blood of the Lamb. Jesus, the Messiah, Yeshua, Hamashiach. It's, that's where it is. That's where it is. Oh, man. You know, I, I've only got a few minutes here that I that I can, a few minutes more I can spare, maybe five minutes. I really wanted to look at Zechariah chapter 12, and um, maybe we can just, you know, we can't do an in-depth study in five minutes, but let's just, let's just look at Matthew, or Zechariah chapter 12 real quick. Let me pull up my e-sword here. Zechariah chapter 12, and let's remember some of the things that we've thought about today. Uh, when dealing with prophecy. You know, I believe that Zechariah chapter 12 took place at that time. There was probably a literal fulfillment for that day, for that day and time. But let's read it again. It's, it's a short chapter. Uh, really, we need 13 and 14 to get the full context. But let's just read chapter 12, and let's think in our minds, could this have a fulfillment in today's time? It, could this be what we're seeing taking place right now? Um, in addition to its literal fulfillment of the day. So, Zechariah chapter 12, verse 1. says, The burden of the word of the Lord for Israel, saith the Lord, which stretcheth forth the heavens, and layeth the foundation of the earth, and formeth the spirit of man without him. Behold, I will make Jerusalem... A cup of trembling unto all the people round about. When they shall be in the siege both against Judah and against Jerusalem. So I'm wondering, is, is this something that we're going to see take place? Is, is the world going to come against Jerusalem now? And will Jerusalem become a cup, cup of trembling? And because it has become a burdensome stone to all the people of the of the world, right? To all the nations of the world, which is what verse 3 says. It says, And in that day, I will make Jerusalem a burdensome stone for all people. All that burden themselves with it shall be cut in pieces. Through all the people of the earth be gathered together against it. In that day, saith the Lord, I will smite every horse with astonishment, and his rider with madness, I will open my eyes upon the house of Judah, and I will smite every horse of the people with blindness. And the governors of Judah shall say in their heart, The inhabitants of Jerusalem shall be my strength, and the Lord of hosts their God. In that day I will make the governors of Judah like a hearth of fire among the wood, like a torch of fire in a sheaf. And they shall devour all the people round about on the right hand and on the left. And Jerusalem shall be inhabited again in her own place, even in Jerusalem. The Lord shall also save the tents of Judah first, that the glory of the house of David and the glory of the inhabitants of Jerusalem do not magnify themselves against Judah. In that day shall the Lord defend the inhabitants of Jerusalem, Jerusalem and he that is feeble among them at that day shall be as David. And the house of David shall be as God, and the angel of the Lord before them. And it shall come to pass in that day that I will seek to destroy all the nations that come against Jerusalem. The last four verses. And I will pour upon the house of David, and upon the inhabitants of Jerusalem, the spirit of grace and of supplications. And they shall look upon me, whom they have pierced. Who's that? Who did... That, that probably had a direct fulfillment in that day, but who does that bring to mind now? And I will pour my upon the house of David and upon the inhabitants of Jerusalem the spirit of grace and of supplications, and they shall look upon me whom they have pierced. 
and they shall mourn for him as one mourneth for his only son and it shall be a bitterness as him as the one that is in bitterness for his firstborn I wonder will this scripture have a future fulfillment maybe soon where a spirit of God is poured out upon the house of David and they will look up, they will look upon him whom they have pierced and they will mourn as one mourneth for his only son and in that day shall there be a great mourning in Jerusalem as the mourning of Hadarimon in the valley of Megiddo and the land shall mourn every family apart the family of the house of David apart and their wives apart and the family of the house of Nathan apart and their wives apart and the family of the house of Levi apart and their wives apart and the family of Shimni or Shimi apart and their wives all the families that remain every family apart and their wives i hope there's a day coming where the spirit of god is poured out upon the current modern land of israel and the eyes of these people be opened and they will see that whom they have pierced and then they will repent and know Jesus and be saved that's that's what i'm hoping for that's my prayer for Jerusalem and for all of Israel that's the broadcast for today i'm sure it's going to be controversial although it shouldn't be it's a simple scripture uh but we shall see i don't know what's going to happen folks keep your eyes open i think the return of the king of kings is soon um He's coming at a time when you think not, so don't think that you've got that figured out, because you don't, and neither do I. Uh, our job is to is to spread the gospel. Our job is to to be the hands and feet of Messiah, and our job is to watch for Him. That's our job. That's what we're all called to do: to share the good news, to be the light of Christ, and to watch for Him. That's your calling. That's every calling. That's the calling of every Christian. Peace and grace be with all of you, and until next time, God bless.